Hello, everybody, and thank you for being here. Uh, Nader and I are glad to be bringing you, I'm not sure what episode it is, 35th, 36th? 36th, maybe. 36th, but we're I'm here a sure. long time. We haven't left the studio in nine months. It's amazing. But we are here today for another great episode of 62 Who Knew? I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank uh, Gary and George. We had a great show last week. I know you couldn't make it, but you were with your mom. Did you get to watch the show? Because I did say happy birthday to your mom at no, the end of the show. Did I didn't. She get to I was see it? doing, no, we were oh, doing birthday stuff for my mom. Doing birthday stuff. <laughs> Millions of people saw her say happy birthday. Well, at least tens of people, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people. But uh, we are here this week, and before we get to our guest who is uh, beaming in from the Weizmann Institute in Israel, <clears throat> let's uh, once again thank our guests again from last week. Gary and George that talked to us about Irma, I-R-M-R-A-A, -A, and, uh, and the penalties that are on people's social security checks uh, that I didn't even see and told us a few ways uh, to get around that and how to contact them to help you have a financial plan so you get to keep more of your social security check. It was, it was an incredible topic. And uh, today's uh, topic of longevity and what the Weizmann Institute is going to be doing for us, uh, for the planet, is, is another great topic. But as usual, we'll start out with telling you <clears throat> the premise of 62 Who Knew. 62 Who Knew, um, you want to do the premise? Um, if you want me to. Switch, switch to Nada. Or, or for, oh, there you even go. Hi. Okay. What is the premise, Nada? What you is do the it premise? I've only been here just a little while. Yes. So the premise of 62 Who Knew yeah, is for those people that are challenging the approaching the age of 62. It's a good thing and it's a bad thing in a way too. So we're dealing with longer lifespans. You have people that if you reach the age of um, 65, you have a 50-50 chance of making it to age 92. That is huge. Are you prepared to deal with another almost 30 plus years of retirement? Do you have enough money to go into that point of your life? Do you have the health? to go into that for the rest of your life. So here we are, we're discussing health, we're discussing finances, we're discussing home, you know, home health for people, we're discussing medical breakthroughs, which is gonna be our, our show tonight with the Weizmann Institute. Um, so it's very interesting that we have, to, we have to really figure out how we can help one another um, go through our 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s, and perhaps 100, and go through it gracefully and happily, as opposed to being stressed out and not in good health, and making sure you have the proper um, lifelines in place, you know, a good financial planner, good family unit, good friends. And we're just here to kind of add to that for you and give you some more information on how you might be able to do that and um, discuss long-term care for you as you approach those ages. Long-term care is something that's very important and, and you shouldn't wait till you're 62 to get that either. You should be looking at it in your 40s or 50s or even earlier, it's much cheaper at that point. And the best thing you could do when you're at that age is to stay home and long-term care provides that. Long-term care provides that somebody come into your home um, or if you do need to go to a nursing home, but it gives you options and choices. And that's what this is all about. This show is all about teaching you different ways to give you more choices as you age. So that is the premise of our show. How'd I do for my first time? I think she did great. <laughs> now, I gave her no notice for that whatsoever. So I just do want the fans to know that if I'm not heard from tomorrow, it's because when they shut off the camera at 8 o'clock, she's going to throw something at me <laughs> um, because I gave her no notice, no time to, to even prepare for that. And I think you did great. Very good. Very good. Thank and you. And the crowd goes wild. <laughs> You did a great job, an Thank absolutely you. great job. And that was no notice. And if you would have practiced, you would have gotten. You would have gotten. I probably would have gotten more yeah, nervous. No, you winged it, you, and you hit it. I'm a square. good winger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're a good winger. <laughs> yes. Um, no, really and truly, you did a great job. You told it all. And um, to, like I said, tonight's guest, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. I can tell you that whether it be due to storms or you know he's coming from us from far away, we are having a little difficulty getting him in right now. He is on the other line with our producer and the owner of WeBeam TV, John Gaston. We're trying to fix it. Let me tell you a little bit about <clears throat> our guest, Mr. Richard Enslein. He is the executive director um, of the Florida region for the American Committee 
of the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel. Uh, Richard travels extensively and has been a guest speaker in so many varying venues uh, where he has uh, not only raised millions and millions, if not tens of millions of dollars um, for the Weizmann Institute, but has shown the country you know, pretty much the beauty of science for all humanity. That is the tagline, that is the credo, that is what the Weizmann Institute preaches and does. It is science for all community. You would think that uh, a 90 year old institute, you know, located in Israel, um, you know, everybody's thinking, well, of course, a bunch of you know, Jewish doctors, um, <laughs> but only about 50% of Weizmann Institute um, is Jewish. The other oh, wow. 50% um, are just the finest, finest minds. Uh, when I asked them about it, when I first got involved with them, you know, is it all Jewish? Is it this? Where do you get your people from? They go, we look at people's minds. We have the best Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Asian. It means nothing to us. It's their brain. If they bring something to humanity, uh, then they are a welcome addition to the Weizmann Institute. And uh, that really is kind of cool if the world lived like that. Can you imagine what kind of world it would be if we just A much at, better one. Yes. Uh, I mean, really incredible. And although I said this today on our... Um, you know, on our preview that I do, synopsis, I just said it right before the show um, on our Facebook Live that we both do a few minutes before the show. But let me give you a few examples um, of what the Weizmann Institute is about. Um, and then if we're successful in, in getting him on, we will bring him right on camera. And if we're not, uh, I'll just keep rambling. Um, <laughs> I'll just, what I'm going to have to do because this is the world of technology. But we're going to get him on any second. I'm going to make a quote here. I'm going to say words. And a lot of times when people say lead the way or number one, they mean that more figuratively than literally. I am saying literally. Google this. Uh, the Weizmann Institute has led the planet uh, in the way of computer science, gene therapy, biochemistry, stem cell research, immune, immune or immunotherapy. We're going to be discussing that now, which is going to be making or to a point has already made chemotherapy obsolete. Whereas well, you know with chemotherapy, um, when it attacks the cancer, it also attacks the good cells of your body. That's why chemo is so difficult, but it has been the way to go the last three decades. This is the next stage, immunotherapy. Where was it created? The, the Weizmann Institute in Israel. The first particle accelerator ever created on the planet was in the 1960s. Um, in the Weizmann Institute. For those of you uh, that don't know what a particle accelerator is, uh, I can give you a very roundabout layman's you know, definition, but it is a long, long tube where molecules are shot between the tubes at light speed. I mean, that just as a Star Trek person for my whole life, at light speed, 182,244 mile, million miles per second. That's like, it's even faster than that. Faster than that. I can't, I can't move my head quick enough. My glasses would fly. I mean, think about that. 182,244,000 miles per second. How do they even record that? that? Yeah, I don't know. Can you imagine? I mean, the, do they have like one of those baseball radar machines I think or it's something? A very, it's a very quick man with a stopwatch. Can you imagine that? It's just amazing. But where was the first particle accelerator created? Um, of course, Israel. Of course, the, I, I guess the most famous one is probably in Switzerland. And the only reason the host of the 62 Who No Shows knows that is because I never uh, miss watching Big Bang Theory. Uh, you can't actually learn a lot from Big Bang Theory. Big Bang Theory and Star Trek. Other than 62 Who Knew, that's what you should be watching when you're not working or loving your family. Watch Star Trek, Big Bang Theory, and the 62 Who Knew show. Um, it, it's just the list continues to go on. John, how are we doing back there? Because I can still, I have a lot. He's working on it, I just was told. Okay, he's getting on a plane, actually, and coming from Israel to see us. He'll be here in about 14 hours, so you just stay tuned. Um, there's, other, <laughs> there's other things. I mean, I, it's just unbelievable here. I know you can't say this, see this. This is like a fraction of what I printed off of what they have done for humanity. And when you think about that, not just done for cancer care or leukemia, uh, uh, Alzheimer's, which they're so close to having a cure for, um, 
you know, um, they do it for humanity. It's science for humanity. And uh, it just really is incredible. Uh, they were the first to introduce cancer research in Israel, and um, they were the first person, I don't even know what this means really, to introduce an ethical drug called Capoxone, developed at the, at the uh, Weizmann Institute and received and approved by the FDA in 1997. I don't know what that is, an ethical drug. I will have to ask him when we get here. Um, their history of philanthropy is, is literally second to none. Um, when you go to the Weizmann Institute, uh, they, again, they don't ask you your religion, uh, your income bracket. Um, they just, it's not part of it. When, when you're at the Weizmann Institute, you're taken care of. They're a research institute. They're not actually a hospital. But to utilize the, um, the, you know, the, the capabilities of them, it's not about how much you make and what the bill is. It's their, their history of philanthropy, uh, not just in Israel or the Mideast uh, or even America around the world is, is just unbelievable. Um, you know, it's, uh, again, I don't know how much I could keep reading. I mean, I know I, I can keep reading. Um, can you? I can. I know how to read. Um, <laughs> We usually don't have these technical difficulties. People are going, why did we turn this on? <laughs> okay, so anyway, we are going to talk tonight about that. We're going to talk about, um, again, one of my big products or big topics is immune therapy. Uh, anybody that has a family member um, that has had cancer or is currently fighting cancer, um, which we do in my family, uh, is going to be very interested in that topic. Um, we are going to be talking about Alzheimer's and um, of course, this is something that you know, you're going through with your family. Mm -hmm. um, go wide angle if you can. There's, there's no reason for people just to be looking at me. <laughs> if we think he's here. Richard, can you hear me? We think we got him. Hold on. Don't go away. Oh, there, there he is. Go. Richard, can you hear me? <laughs> I see him. I don't hear I him. I see Richard, but I don't hear him. Richard, do you hear me? And why does it say Mr. David Hall? <laughs> Richard, do you hear me? I don't. Well, we see you now, but we don't hear you. We see him, but we don't hear him. Do you know sign language, Richard, by any chance? Can he hear you? Can Richard, you hear us? Nod your head if you hear me. All right, well, we're getting there. We're halfway there. Well, we're happy to see you. We always love seeing your pretty face here on 62 Who Knew. Um, and we'll get you speaking in just a minute. I've been, uh, I've been trying to uh, tell everybody about the unbelievably wonderful things that the Weizmann Institute has done for humanity, um, but I can't do it as well and as eloquently as you can. So um, we know we, uh, we will have you here any minute. Momentarily. Momentarily. So how you been? I've been doing well. How about good, yourself? Good, good, good. Yeah, good. Okay. Are we almost there? We're almost there. All right. show on reverse mortgages right before Christmas. Uh, as you know, the reverse mortgage of today is not the reverse mortgage of yesteryear. It is a totally protected uh, right now for your uh, estate, for your heirs. They can never be negative. They can never lose money on the reverse mortgage. In today's reverse mortgage, which is a big part of paying for in-home care, for long-term care insurance, for eliminating your mortgage payment, for eliminating your car payment, uh, credit cards, all types of debt. Um, today's reverse mortgage is being used for so many things. Uh, and of course, the last six to nine months, we have what is known as proprietary products that now go up to $10 million, which is uh, opening up an entirely new uh, frame of existence, an entirely new market for what we do during the day when we're not here. Um, talking aimlessly into a camera without a guest when we're not here doing this. Yep. Um, we are doing, well, regular mortgages, Regular of mortgages. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA, 3% um, down, 3.5% down. But this new, it's not so new anymore, proprietary product is allowing people um, with multi-million dollar houses uh, to come up 
and say, you know what, I need to take a couple of million out. And, yeah. um, and we're, we're enjoying that for a lot of reasons. I mean, it's, uh, it's great that, uh, you know, that, you, okay. Well, oh, I'm sorry, do we have Richard? Yes, yes. Richard, can you, oh, we see Richard? Richard, say hello. Good evening, Michael. Oh, we got, we can hear him. We see his beautiful face. We can hear his voice. I think you should start out now with, um, I'm thinking singing I Left My Heart in San Francisco because we've been waiting for you so long. We want you to make a, a really good entrance. How are you, sir? Excellent. How about yourself? We're doing great. I had to ramble a little waiting for you to come on. So uh, whatever guests are still left watching are so happy to see you. You have no idea. And we just went back again. Well, all righty. Well, I thank you for inviting me this evening. Sorry, we had the technical problem. That's okay. Um, I wanted to speak to you about uh, the Weizmann Institute of Science, one of the world's top multidisciplinary research institutes, uh, rated by Nature Magazine number six in the world. Wow. And um, the only place on the list in the top 15 that's outside the United States. The Weizmann Institute is located in Rehoboth, Israel, about 17 miles southeast of Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. It's a 3,800-person uh, uh, basic science research institute with graduate students, research technicians, and staff. And their science is based on the curiosity principle, to hire the best people in the world and to let them have their academic freedom to follow their curiosity in order to find answers to new questions, finding answers to uh, new knowledge that people haven't uh, known before. And that's really, uh, Michael, the, the definition of basic research, finding new knowledge. And, and that's amazing. And, and again, even though we were laughing the last 15 minutes as, as we were going through our technical problems, you know, as I continue to read what the Weizmann Institute has contributed to humanity it's just really amazing and and so we're starting a little late um i'm just going to let you take over tell us what's new uh, i'm of course very interested in the immunotherapy if i'm saying it correctly we talked a lot when you were here in july about stem cell therapy um, i know you were doing some incredible things uh with the particle accelerator uh, i'm going to let you pick and go with it what's new and what 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 can we look forward to as we now are living to be 90 and 95, what is the Weizmann Institute going to give to humanity as they, as they have for decades so we can take that above 100 and keep going? Well, recently, uh, two of the Weizmann scientists were, were uh, awarded the Israel Prize. And every year on, uh, on Israel Independence Day, on Yom HaTzmuk, at Mount Herzl, the Prime Minister gives out the Israel Prize. And in uh, the life sciences here, Professor Adi Kimpke has won the Israel Prize um, for, um, for pioneering and deciphering the mechanism program in program cell death in mammals. So basically what this is, Michael, is that we have cells in our body that are programmed to die at a certain time and to replenish themselves, get new cells. So an easy example is your skin. Uh, skin cells die, and the women especially will, will rub creams on their skin, rub the dead skin off, and the new skin regenerates. Well, in our body, in all of our organs, in our stomach and our liver and all of our primary organs, the same thing happens. And when those cells don't die when they're programmed to, they keep multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. And what do you get? A tumor, cancer. Oh. So Professor Kimke's science uh, that she was just awarded a, a prize for in molecular gen genetics, she's found a way to cause apoptosis. It's a difficult sounding word. It's a word that comes from the Greek but basically it means programming cell death. So she can program the cells to die when they're supposed to. 
there's also a process in all our cells in our body called autophagy. And autophagy is really getting rid of the dead cells. So think of, if you would, uh, Pac-Man that we used to play when we were kids. Yeah. That would chew up the little white dots. Mm -hmm. the, um, the debris left from the dead cells is cleared by certain cell mechanisms in our body. And when that doesn't clear, then we get all types of diseases also in our bodies. Mm -hmm. So she's also found a way through uh, RNA messengers to... Um, To be able to clear clear the cells. More specifically, she's found co factors uh, called DAP genes that are responsible for the decision and, and signaling pathways that drive different forms of cell death. And she's come up with a new way of, of screening RNA to identify the no novel regulators and agents of cell death. And for this great discovery, she's won the Israel Prize in uh, Life Sciences which is the highest prize that someone in Israel can, can win. <clears throat> so you're, you're literally looking at the, the first steps of curing cancer, because if you can get rid of, uh, if you can never actually create the cancerous tumor, um, then the cancer won't appear. Or am I, am I being too simplistic about that? No, you're, you're, you're correct. Um, it's, it's a little bit of an oversimplification, but um, as you were talking also in your introduction, um, there are many groups that are working on cancer. 50% of Weizmann scientists work on cancer. And there are groups that are working, as you said, on immunotherapy. The 2015 Israel Prize winner, Professor Zelegeshaw, won the prize for coming up with the idea of having killer T cells. So I'm oversimplifying it. He came up with the time killer T cells. So we all know that we have T, T cells in our body, our white blood cells. When we get sick, we get a virus, we get bacteria to cause infection. The T cells will come in and eradicate that. Mm -hmm. And in blood cancers, they found that now with certain drugs that supercharge the immune system, they can use your own T cells to kill certain types of blood cancers. Um, this was done in clinical trials at the University of Pennsylvania Medical Center, where uh, nine men were allowed by the FDA, by the U.S. government, to be given this treatment in 2011. Uh, they all had 30 days or less to live. That's why the, they were allowed to do it on humans. And I can tell you that three years later, seven of the nine men were in total remission. My and that's why today that you gives me the chills. Yeah, it really does. That's that. That's why today that uh, you read in the newspapers about immunotherapy. So what's really happening around the world now, and it's happening at the Weizmann Institute, it becomes more of uh, personalized medicine, where mm -hmm. we're finding that all of us have different genes and different DNA makeup in our bodies, and that. One treatment may work on myself, but it may not work on you and vice versa. So they're finding that they need to personalize these treatments to make them more effective in solid tumor cancers. And when you say personalize them, what are they, I'm assuming, uh, because we, I have a family member fighting cancer right now, the, you know, and who I hope is going to be starting the immunotherapy in less than 30 days, and his surgeon took a biopsy uh, from one of the cancerous tumors, and from that I think they are... I, I guess, for lack of better terms, custom making uh, or creating the immunotherapy from him so they know exactly what to attack? That's exactly correct. Um, you've got a great grasp of it. Um, the, all of us have different genes. You know, some women may have the BRCA gene. Other women might not have the BRCA gene, which we know will cause breast cancer. And we know that cancer is many different diseases. It's not just one disease, so it could be a number of diseases in the same cell. So the drugs, the immunotherapy drugs, may work on my on myself and may not work on you or vice versa. Right. So they really have to personalize the information that they get from the cells in order for the doctors to properly treat the patient. And, and is so this, this is where medicine is going? Th this is literally done on a on a molecular level. 
Yes, uh, absolutely. That's, uh, that's amazing. There are, there are centers at the Weizmann Institute where scientists can go and share time on one of our kind equipment in Israel where they can magnify things millions and millions of times and even on certain new equipment a billion times. And one of the methodologies that the Weizmann Institute uses is that if, um, if you have a, uh, a machine in your lab in another place in the world, um, only you can use it, and if you happen to allow a colleague to use it, um, that would be kind of you. But at Weizmann, there's a, a more efficiency of scale, and all of the uh, nano imaging equipment are in nano imaging centers, and all of the scientists can register to use the that equipment at certain times, and they really run 24 hours a day. Um, so that's one of the geniuses of the institute, where everyone can share the the uh, latest equipment. It's almost like a, a science kibbutz, where everybody <laughs> is sharing communal property. Uh, and and for our non-Jewish. Uh viewers, uh, a science kibbutz would be a community of scientists. <laughs> Just, yeah. Remember, I'm not on the east coast of Florida, Richard. I'm on the west coast. Lots of goyim. So we have to explain the kibbutz thing. Well, <laughs> oh, well, and by the way, goyim is not a bad word. Anybody thinking about that? Just a non-Jewish person. I didn't insult anybody. Got to be careful here. Well, the, well, the, the, the beautiful thing about the White Spoon Institute and I'll give you an example. We don't have an, an undergraduate program, we, but we do have a graduate school. And when you go to the postdoctoral program, you will find that 68%, I'll repeat that, 68% of the postdoctoral students are foreign. They come with every Isn't that amazing? color skin, every shape of eye. They just want the best students and the best brains the, in the laboratory. Children. That is cool. Now that that's just amazing. You had said you look at their minds the last time you were here. You know, not the shape of their eyes or the color of their skin, just their minds. Yes, and uh, our best stem cell research is a researcher is a Druze Arab. Um, mm -hmm. There are. We just recently had a tour of graduate students, PhD students in the U.S. And in one of the cities, uh, my colleagues reported to me that there was an Arab student. Mm -hmm. um, I've had students come from Ethiopia, from all different countries. Uh, a lot of these students go back to their countries to share the knowledge that they obtained at the Weizmann Institute, and occasionally some of them stay. And one of the PhD students uh, who just came to Florida uh, told me of her Italian professor, an Italian woman, uh, Mrs. Baratella, and uh, she did her postdoc at Weissman, and she met an Israeli man. She married him and decided to stay. Mm -hmm. um, this happens quite often uh, also in reverse. Uh, people will come from America, from Argentina, from South Africa. I've met uh, uh, postdoctoral men who ended up serving in the Israeli army, having their families in Israel. And when I asked them personally while having dinner them, how did that happen? How did you end up in Israel from South Africa or Argentina? And he said, well, I met a beautiful, dark-haired Israeli girl. <laughs> I fell in love and, and never left. That's right. So it, really is, it really is a conglomeration of people. I call it the United Nations of Science. Well, that's just incredible. Can you imagine if the world viewed each other, you know, as the, as, a, as the Weizmann Institute and looking at you for your mind and and not for the color of your skin or the shape of your eyes. If the world could live like that, we'd have a better world. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is really a model, a uh, place to do science. Um, many of the scientists live on campus. When I talk to them, how long is your commute to work? They'll tell me it's a two-minute walk. Mm -hmm. uh, they can go to their labs. The young scientists, especially the women scientists, um, have uh, the ability to put their children into daycare on campus, to be able to visit them at lunchtime, pick them up in the evening, take them home, mm -hmm. and then if they wish, they go back to the lab. So it is a, 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 science, a science community. Um, 
that is really beneficial for everyone. Uh, we do have uh, Adi Kimki, who won the, uh, the Israel Prize this week, um, is also uh, one of her noted achievements is uh, supporting a female scientist on campus and in the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. And what they've, what they've done, uh, they took about 10 years ago, 12 years, 12 years ago, I think, when I first joined the Institute, a uh, census of why there is such a small percentage of full women professors. And in any university, you must do your master's of science, your PhD degree, and then in Israel, you must go abroad to do your postdoctoral work in a great lab at Harvard or MIT or Caltech. Right. But they don't want in inbreeding of ideas. They want you to go, what's go learn what's going on in a great lab in Oxford in England or at the Pasteur in France. And what they found where they were losing the women after their PhD programs, that the women had served two years in the Army, uh, they travel for a year, as most Israelis do. They take uh, a couple of years, to four years to do their, uh, their Bachelor of Science, a few years to do their Master's program, three years to do their postdoctoral program. And by the time they're ready to do three years to do their PhD program, excuse me, and by the time they're ready to do their postdoctoral program, they're generally around 32. They're married and they have families. And they have to go to... Uh, their husbands and say, I really want to continue my career. I'd like to go abroad. I have a scholarship for my postdoc. And generally what happened in the past was the husband said, well, what if I can't find a job? What if I can't put food on the table? How are we going to do that? And the women were giving up their careers for that reason. And what we started about 10 years ago at Weitzman was to give the women on top of their scholarships an extra $40,000 living stipend so they can say to their husbands, come, come with me. I can, I can take care of the roof over our head. I can make sure the children are fed. They'll have time to find a job. And now we found this many years later that the number of women's full doc professors has tripled. Wow. Because they're given the opportunity to continue their dreams in science. That's amazing. That is amazing. Um, you would not only is it for white, white women, uh, women, but for women of any university in Israel can apply for the program, and they'll be funded to go abroad to do their postdocs. So that's, in, in, that's incredible. In, in Israel, we look at women's brains as 50% of the natural resources. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you had mentioned in passing, and I'm just going to go backwards just for a few minutes, um, you know, how much nanotechnology was being used um, in some of the research at the Institute. And, and again, even though, um, you know, people laugh sometimes when I say this, I, I don't know a lot about nanotechnology, but it all came from Star Trek, um, even though it's true. So if you could, just for a second, I, I could give an explanation, but you're going to give it much better. Tell our audience just a little about nanotechnology. Well, the word nano really means tiny, it means small. And we've learned that with certain equipment, we can see the cells under the cells under the cells. And when you get into things like stem cells, you get into particles that really have to be magnified millions of times to see them. Um, even uh, with MRI equipment today that you go into and have MRI tests done here in the States or in other countries around the world, there are machines now with much larger, more powerful magnets. The latest machine coming from Siemens in Germany, they call a seven Tesla machine. And we now have one of those machines at the Weizmann Institute of Science. So when we put someone into that machine, or even an animal that they're doing research on, they can see much more now than they've ever been able to see before. And this will only help diagnosis and positive outcomes um, in treating many different types of diseases. Gotcha. Uh, I can tell you that uh, 
Also, another Israel Prize winner, to switch gears for a second, is a Professor Dan Yakir. And we're all hearing now about um, the global climate. And to very quickly, because I know we, we unfortunately had a... No, we're, we're good. We, we got 20 good minutes left for us. But to, to talk about Dan's research and why he was uh, just... Uh, awarded the Israel Prize for Research in Geology, Earth Science, and Atmospheric Sciences, um, he's found the impact of semi-arid uh, forests on the global climate. And basically, to go to the bottom line with his research, he's found that if we plant forests in Australia, and I believe it was South Africa, that the the trees will absorb carbon and give off oxygen and change and cool the earth by at least 10%. And end global so warming? Great, well, it's a, it would be a, a beginning wow. to change the temperature swings from being a heated planet to a cooling planet. So out of basic research from a scientist who has a station at, in uh, the uh, on the edge of the Negev Desert, where for years he's been studying this outpost and studying the effect that the trees have on the climate, they come up with this astounding finding that they know exactly where on Earth to plant the trees to get the greatest effect of absorbing carbon and giving off more oxygen. Oh, that's so, interesting. This is another, another, another major, major breakthrough that will affect all of you, man. So, what happens when a when a brilliant scientist comes up with a theory like that? You know, now, now what? Do they look for other people in the scientific community to prove that theory, agree that theory, and and, and then we stop planting trees in those places? I mean, what, what is it going to take? Let's face it: global warming is is a real threat. Um, you know, there's a certain political party that thinks it's going to end the world. There's the other, you know, far extreme of another political party that says we don't have to worry about it at all, which is stupidity. Um, but it's somewhere in the middle. It's a real threat. What's next now that this incredible discovery has happened? How do we take it to practically applying it to help the planet? Well, we're an apolitical organization. We don't get involved in politics. I know. I love that. In finding the truth. Um, and the truth is that humans do have an effect and have had an effect on the climate of the, of the planet. Absolutely. Um, so I'll leave it at that statement, not to go into politics. Yes. Um, um, and we know in science that, and if you look back to, way, to the Ice Age, and you look back to what's happened over many tens of thousands of years, the planet changed on its own. We have a Teutonic plate. We have volcanoes that deep under the earth. They explode. Uh, they cause changes in climates. Uh, the, the largest such um, action happened at Santorini when that largest volcano yep. blew many, many, many years ago. And it changed the climates of the Mediterranean basin to Israel, all through Italy, Greece. Um, and, it, and it really changed because of the amount of ash that went to the atmosphere, the entire globe's uh, uh, climate. Right. So, you know, we've, we've had the Ice Age. We know we've, we've gone through that. But why did that happen? So I say that because there are a number of reasons that... The planet changes its temperature, but obviously humans are a great factor. Yeah. We do our damage, it seems, wherever we go. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, so we, uh, we have about 15 minutes left. I know we're going to talk about something very near and dear to my heart that's happening out in space, but I don't know if we have. Did you want to talk about anything else that's going on? Um, that has to do with longevity and, um, you know, that's going on in the Weizmann Institute before we get to what I think is a, a, a very, very happy topic. 
Well, we'll get to space in in, uh, in a minute. Yes, I do want to speak about that because it's right. happening as we speak. It's a yes. very timely subject. But um, there are a thousand different research groups at the Weizmann Institute, and they collaborate in countries all over the world. So the question you asked before, are other scientists uh, proving or disproving theories? Absolutely. And they work together. Once a scientist patents a discovery, they'll publish it in Nature Magazine, the New England Journal of Medicine, Science Magazine, Cell Magazine, and the scientists decide who around the world they want to work with. So they do prove or disprove each other's theories, and there is a world scientific community, and they all travel to conferences all around the globe to see what's going on in other people's labs, and also to authenticate amazing. or mm -hmm. disprove different theories. So there is tremendous collaboration in the world. Uh, I personally think we can achieve peace through science, but that's yes. a whole nother, a whole nother. We subject. could do it. We could do a show on that. There is no doubt in my, in my mind that we could have you know, world peace, which most people think is a, uh, is a fantasy, but you can achieve peace through science because, because wars happen because people are suffering. And uh, uh, on some certain level, there's, there's no doubt we can, atta we can obtain peace through science. Well, to go to the subject that you touched on, um, I see we're getting to... Uh, the end of the hour. Um, recently, two months ago, um, and I'll give you the background on it, uh, Israel and Space IL in particular put a lunar craft landing module on top of a Saturn 9 rocket from Elon Musk and was launched from Cape Canaveral into space. And the equipment to do the scientific experiments on the moon, on the unmanned lunar module, was built at the Weizmann Institute of Science. And I'll touch back on that in a minute. But um, the rocket was launched successfully. There were seven different maneuvers that have happened since the launch in February. Um, the capsule has traveled. Uh, many tens of millions of miles and has left the Earth's gravitational pull and has entered the Moon's gravitational pull. And we expect on this Thursday evening, the 11th of April, Israel will land the spacecraft on the Moon mm -hmm. to be the fourth country in the world that accomplished that feat behind the United States, Russia, and China. We recently today received pictures from the dark side of the moon, including pictures of Earth from the dark side of the moon. They're on the White, Weitzman website. You can see them for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're hoping that everything goes right and that on Thursday evening, Israel will land on the moon. Incredible. We're going to conduct... Uh, we're going, it is very incredible for you to think of a country that was born 75 years ago. That's right. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, that they now have the, uh, the innovation and the ability to land on the moon. This started as a, uh, a Google uh, SpaceX prize some years ago mm -hmm. where $10 million was offered for the country that could land a, a craft on, on the moon. Um, the time frame for the dollar prize ran out, and on a shoestring budget, on a $100 million budget, when the other countries spent billions of dollars on it, uh, from private philanthropic monies, about 10 families put in $10 million each, they raised $100 million, and through private, through Israel space, through Israel uh, aerospace industries, through uh, private uh, investors, and now with the equipment from the Weizmann Institute of Science, uh, we're hoping that this vehicle has a successful landing on the moon. They're going to test many, many different magnetic uh, 
qualities of the moon rock and uh, the surface of the moon. Uh, there's a lot of questions about the magnetism that the moon has and uh, the gravitational pull on the Earth. And I just learned this afternoon that they're going to land in a sea of tranquility where the Americans landed a, um, a manned space vehicle and they dropped X amount of pounds of human waste on the moon. And they're going to do an experiment to see what happened to that human waste <laughs> oh my in, zero, in, zero, in zero gravity. <laughs> that, I don't know what the purpose of that experiment is, but I'm sure they do. Now, are, they, are we going to be mystified if they point the camera at the waste and there's a sign there that says, please flush and wash your hands before leaving? <laughs> We've got to wonder who wrote that sign. Well, actually, actually we know now... Uh, from uh, experiments and from the science at the Weizmann Institute of Science that um, all of our bodies digest food differently. There's a lot of talk in, in, the, in the health care world now about the microbiome. That started with uh, uh, some years ago at the Weizmann Institute with professors Iran Elianoff and Iran uh, Segal, and they proved that uh, Michael, you could eat ice cream and I could, I could uh, eat sushi, and my blood sugar could spike higher than yours. Huh. It has to do with the bacteria in your microbiome, and the deep, your microbiome, the bacteria in your microbiome, has more DNA than our bodies, and we're finding now that there's also an effect between. The uh, DNA in our microbiome and the way each of us absorbs a drug. So there's a there's a thin epithelial layer of skin in our gut between the bacteria and the, between us. And basically, our bodies are made up of a high percentage of bacteria. Mm -hmm. So now we're first learning how this bacteria affects our health. And uh, you see in health foods now, they're selling all this probiotics. And yes. There's questions about whether or not this works or not. But there are studies that are going on that show that, for instance, uh, synthetic sugars uh, are more harmful than pure sugar. I've, I've heard that, that your yes. body can digest the pure sugar much easier than the synth synthetic. So the sweet and low, the equal, it has it, it kills the microbiome, and it can cause higher blood sugar than regular sugar. It can cause hypertension, and it can cause dementia. Other than that, it's good to put in your coffee. Yeah, other than that, it's just, <laughs> it's just great. Now, where I, I want, I have to go back back to space for a second because it's it's just my thing because I think we left something very important out uh, because we're boldly going where no Jews have ever gone before. I think we're going to be having an Israeli flag up there, aren't we? That's correct. We're putting an Israeli flag on the moon. We're also putting a time capsule on the moon. Uh, some of the items that will be in there will be a small Torah, will be the words to Hatikva, and this will be left on the moon in a time capsule. So yes, Michael, your information is correct. And is, with a successful moon landing, the Israeli flag will be on the map. To me, again, I know you just said it, but it's worth repeating. A country that is uh, barely 75 years old uh, or less uh, that is up there with uh, the United States, Russia, China, uh, the fourth flag to be, uh, to be mounted on another planet. It's just, uh, it's just another staggering example of what comes out of Israel um, that benefits the world because you know whatever scientific breakthroughs they have there, um, by examining and researching the magnet. Yeah. I mean, let's face it, the moon is uh, a quarter of a billion miles away, and yet it affects our oceans and our bays and our bodies. And uh, again, you know whatever, they, whatever greatness comes out of this research, um, the Weizmann Institute is going to share with the world. It's, it, it's, it really is an incredible thing. Well, the... It goes back to the history. It goes back to Chaim Weitzman himself. In November 2nd, 1949, they renamed the Daniel Seif Institute, which started in 1934, the Weitzman Institute of Science. 
And on that day, when that ceremony occurred, Weitzman made, gave a speech. And to paraphrase his speech, he said, we won't be able to have a country exporting Jaffa oranges. <laughs> but we don't have, we don't have uh, minerals under the earth. We don't have oil under the earth. So the only thing that we're going to be able to export is innovation, is brain power. And if you think back to how prophetic that was in 1949 for a country that was born in 1948 to now Thursday putting a vehicle on the moon, it's quite astounding. Yeah, and, and not to get too, um, well, I don't know what the word would be, but also to think that, what did you say, this was 1949? Yeah. Yes, you 1949 say, he gave that speech. Just, um, just four years after World War II ended and, um, and, the, and the Jewish population of the world was, was, was almost wiped out and, and so many millions lost for four years later for this institute to start. And even then, um, with the pure credo or message of giving back, again, to me, just a, another staggering you know, example uh, of the way the people of Israel think. Well, the, the tagline on my card and everyone who works for the Weizmann Institute is these words, science for the benefit of humanity. Yeah, very, just so that, unbelievable. That, I think, says, says it all. It's, it's um, when you take one of the seven, of the top 25 selling drugs in the world, that has its origins in the Weizmann Institute. We don't ask you, are you, are, are you Jewish? Yeah. We, we, you take, everybody takes the drug. No, no one knows where it comes from. That's right. So we see, we see commercials on TV. It could say Amgen or Abbott Labs or Johnson & Johnson. But the R&D of a lot of these drugs were, were done at the Weizmann Institute. And the patents were licensed to these drug companies, and that's why you see it. So there are many, many, many life-saving drugs and life-altering drugs that have come to Israel. And again, to repeat it, it's science for the benefit of humanity. It's science for everyone. Well, we barely have about three minutes left. I'm sorry we had the, uh, the difficulties in the beginning. We're going to have to get you back a little quicker this time, but we'll practice more before we... Uh, we turn on the cameras. In fact, I, don't, you know, I think I asked you this one time before. Of course, uh, you know, are you ever on my side of Florida? Yes, yes. I, uh, I'm in uh, Sarasota, Naples, St. Petersburg, Tampa. I, I do come there uh, just a few times a month. Yes. I'm All right, well, give us some notice next time because not only will Nader and I take you out to dinner, but maybe we could do a show uh, with you sitting right here at the desk with us. That would be kind of incredible. I think that would be the prudent thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because we don't want to have to call Israel to have their help just to get you live on the 62. <laughs> Guys, can you take some time out of the whole cancer thing and help us go live on 62? <laughs> we need some nanotechnology like right now. Well, it's, uh, it's science that is shared around the world, as I said. Um, there are many scientists that collaborate with us, and Weizmann doesn't have a hospital. So a lot of the human collaborations that are going on are going on right here in this country at major hospitals, like Sloan Kettering in New York, like uh, MD Anderson in Houston, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in, in uh, Seattle, John Hopkins, the Acres of Cancer Center in Philadelphia. Um, many, many of these centers are collaborating with Weizmann scientists, with their doctors, and they're trying to bring these new ideas to the clinic. Um, so stay tuned for what for what's coming next. Um, the the world of personalized medicine, the world of immunotherapy, is exploding. Uh, if we have another minute, I can tell you that there's a drug that's uh, recently approved by the EMA that we're expecting the FDA to approve shortly. And uh, this drug has been shown to be 87% effective in prostate cancer, and they're now going to be doing clinical trials on pancreatic cancer, which is a killer. Unbelievable. 
Well, we have a little less than a minute to go. Uh, again, please, a couple of quick things. Let us know when you're going to be in the Tampa Bay, St. Pete area, so not only we can meet in person, but we can get you into the studio for a, an up-close and personal show. As always, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we just love hearing from you and what's happening um, at the Weizmann Institute. It's, uh, we're proud of a lot of our great guests that come on here Absolutely. that have national reputations, but nobody no, has the uh, the yeah, and, yeah. But nobody has the the worldwide implications as the Weizmann Institute. Um, so thank you so much, Richard. Thank you. Thank you for having me. How much longer do we have? Ten seconds. We have fifteen seconds. In the fifteen seconds left. Nate and I didn't do very much in this show except to be <laughs> in, awe, in, in, in awe of our guest. And uh, we thank him for being there. And in the last few seconds, Pizza Man, if you're watching, I have a nephew that is in a big battle right now. Mwah. We love you. Bye.